Everyone, and welcome to back to the Time Shifters podcast. We are in studio as almost always. This is Christopher. I'm here with Matt. Hey. Uh, thanks for tuning in as usual. I'm always thankful to, I, I'm assuming someone's out there listening besides Floyd. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and I certainly appreciate uh, Floyd and all his feedback and uh, responses he's given too. Don't have any this week though, but if we did he would have sent it to time shifters podcast at gmail.com or he would have come to our facebook group and join uh, join in some discussions there or started a discussion or two i always like it when people come by and actually start their own discussions in the group i always feel like i'm always posting some article and maybe you know we'll get a few likes on it or someone will comment or whatever but i always love it when someone comes over and says i watched this movie and you know something like that always a always kind of fun yeah you can, of course, also follow uh, us on Twitter. We are at Time Shifters Pod, and uh, you can follow Matt over there at Movies at the Mat, as well as his other podcast, which is Season Fourteen. Time for a podcast. And what's the uh, Twitter for that one? At Season Fourteen Podcast. That seems easy, and I didn't <laughs> remember all right. it. <laughs> and uh, we'll actually hear a promo for his podcast. He finally put a promo together. He and his co-host. So we'll uh, have that going out on this episode in a little bit. So uh, I think we should probably talk a little bit of news. Um, I got a few things to start with. Kind of, uh, we got a few more um, memorials, I guess. A few more, uh, a few more deaths in the entertainment industry. This this one kind of took me back because I honestly I did not know about um, Stephen Hillenberg's uh, suffering with ALS. Yeah, apparently he diagnosed last year with it. Or yeah, the year maybe before. that's maybe that's why I didn't hear about it because it was it was fairly recent. Yeah. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, he died from complications, you know, resulting in that. And he, for those who don't know the name, was the creator of SpongeBob SquarePants, yep. which for a parent of a young child was one of the shows that I didn't mind watching. You know, I really enjoy it. That's one of those shows, too, where I'll if I turn on the TV and it's still on whatever channel my kid was watching and SpongeBob is on, I'm not quick to turn it off or sure. change the channel you know i'll sit there and watch and see which episode it was <laughs> yeah. it is. it's a clever show it really is and hillenberg he started out as a writer on rocco's modern life the other nicktoon show and you could really see a lot of the comparison between rocco and spongebob of like here's your main character he's a little bit goofy his best friend is an overweight dope and then there's all these other kind of colorful characters mm -hmm. but SpongeBob debuted in 1999. They are still doing new episodes. They are still doing movies. It's about to turn 20 years old. And that doesn't happen by accident. No. And Nickelodeon just put out this wonderful tribute video where they just use clips from the episodes. And it's SpongeBob singing with his friends, hugging his friends playing games with his friends, telling them that this is all about having the best day ever. And it's like, that that's why the show has endured, because it's a little bit weird, it's a little bit dark at times, <laughs> yeah. but it's a healthy dose of it, especially for kids, because the bottom line is it's a positive show. Exactly, yeah, exactly. And so there's been a lot of other, like, positive kid shows that didn't last, mm -hmm. because they didn't mix in all of those other things. But you put all of that together, and that's why you have a show that's about to turn 20 years old. Yeah, I love episodes. <laughs> I love that it, at times it deals with kind of like real world kid problems, yeah, but in a funny way. Like, what was it? Um, oh, when Patrick and um, SpongeBob think they borrow a balloon and yes. it pops, so now they're afraid they've stolen this balloon and they're in trouble and they don't know what to do. And like, you know, that is the thought process of a kid. If he like picks some little toy off a shelf and doesn't tell mom or something like that. It, that ties in. Yeah. I, I love that about that show. And that's mm -hmm. just one example. Yeah. They do a lot of stuff like that. So he was uh, fantastic, just a very inventive person. And, you know, you only had to really hit the nail once right <laughs> sometimes. And, and he did it with the SpongeBob. So thank you, uh, Stephen. That was, you know, and thoughts and best wishes to all his family and his friends and, and all his fans. Yeah. Another death, unfortunately... That just happened as we record this, and this is uh, – Matt wasn't familiar with them. Ken Berry, who was a staple of 70s and 80s television and uh, even some big screen films uh, like uh, Disney, uh, Herbie – was it Herbie Rides Again or – one of the Herbie movies. I always – I already forgot. 
but he's best known for Mama's Family and F Troop, but he also appeared in The Andy Griffith Show uh, spinoff Mayberry RFD, and he as well as showing up in The Bob Newhart Show, uh, The Love Boat, Fantasy Island, Chips, The Golden Girls. I mean, if there was a cameo to be had, you know, <laughs> if a show could have a cameo or a, a guest star, he was going to be in it at least once. And it was Herbie Rides again. He also starred in The Cat from Outer Space, as far as another Disney big screen film. But he was just um, he was just this great, I don't even know how to describe him, just this friendly face whenever he would show up kind of thing. And he was always funny and just always a pleasure to watch. And so, uh, yeah, he was just one of those, when I think back of shows that I watch, he's like one of those faces that always just kind of pops into the memory. So, uh, he was 85 and he had a, he had a good life and a long career. So, uh, yeah, thoughts go out to Ken Berry and his, again, his friends and family. He was, he'll be missed. That's all the sad news I had. Good news, kind of a surprise, a little bit of a rebirth almost. This surprised me. Uh, ABC has renewed Marvel agents of shield for the seventh season kind of surprised to hear about that i was very surprised when that news came across the feed because after the last season it was obvious that they were pretty confident that they probably wouldn't be coming back and they did an episode that kind of wrapped things up or you know if it didn't come back everyone would be good that's the way it should end now the i that that's coming back i'm almost sorry that it is because kind of like <laughs> okay you had this great ending how are you going to screw this up? <laughs> yeah. That's a big fear. Because I love the show. I really do enjoy the show. I'm surprised because Disney's going to be launching their streaming service some point in the next year, maybe a little bit just over. But I keep hearing like end of 2019, beginning of 2020. And all of their Netflix Marvel shows are getting canceled because most likely because of that, not necessarily to move them over, but because why would you have your own property on a direct competitor? And I get that Disney owns ABC, but I, if it's supposed to be a show that's technically tied to the movies, why wouldn't you just put everything under one roof Yeah, and increase your odds of people subscribing to your new streaming service? So if it's coming back, why wouldn't it be coming back to that? But why is it coming back at all with kind of like the things I've read? Because I couldn't even get through the first season. It just didn't pull me in. But everything I've read up on it, there's like a lot of been like mixed feelings and that it was kind of like people were saying like, okay, this show has run its course and that it ended kind of well. And now it's back. Yeah. I almost wonder if like everybody involved was like, all right, good. We're done. Wait, what? Yeah. We have to get... Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Now what are we going to do? It's been a roller coaster, I'll admit. The first season was one of these things where I, I watched, I was, you know, vaguely interested. And then in the end, I thought, okay, that was decent. I'll, I'll tune in for season two. And then that's where it really kicked off for me. And I really enjoyed it. And then, yeah, season six, a lot of season six, you know, five, six, whatever. It was kind of like, hmm, okay. You know, I'm still enjoying some stuff. Uh, it became one of these things where... I enjoy it more for the characters than the story in, in a lot of, lot of ways. But yeah, they ended it in, to, in a way that I was thinking, I'm happy with that ending. And now to bring it, spin it back, and it's like, I I don't know. I'm, I'm really concerned that I'm just going to be disappointed in whatever they come up with to bring this thing back. But I don't know. We will see. I've given them six years. And what's another? What's one more? <laughs> this is the point where, like, the writers are like, all right, uh, someone's going to have a baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On a very special Marvel agency. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's the kind of thing that happens. Introducing get... Cousin Oliver. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> you worry that that's what's going to happen. Yeah. I'm a little Ted McGinley's going to show up and uh, <laughs> it'll definitely be the last season. That's all the news that I had. And that was actually, the, the Marvel news is actually fairly old. I think that was announced even before we recorded the last time, but uh, we didn't mention it. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Well, the other thing that happened since last time was they dropped the teaser trailer for the new remake of The Lion King. You haven't watched it. I didn't bother. Here's the thing. You've already seen it. That's the, I, I, I just read a few comments on the, like on the thing or on the post and that was enough every single shot is a shot from 
the original animated movie. No one saw the Psycho remake. <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> and and I get it. It's the teaser. They can drop a real trailer later where they really get into like what's different about it. But as of right now, it's a shot for shot remake. And that's what they wanted you to know. Like, look, here, like the exact same angles, the same lighting, you know, the birds flying over and all the animals showing up and there's Pride Rock and there's Simba being held up. And I'm like, you're not showing me a movie I haven't seen yet. Right. This is ridiculous. Like, what's the message of this, this trailer? I don't get it. Well, and I, I don't understand the they like to call it live action. Oh, any, don't get me started. <laughs> it's anything but. It's just better. It's just a different form of animation. Right. And yeah, uh, what what's the point so far? I don't yeah. get it. Like they want to remake some of their animated movies, fine. Put a different twist on them. Do something like maybe Mufasa doesn't die. Like you know, do something. It's anything. Yeah, if you want to do a live action. There's been live action Lion King, wasn't it? Hamlet. Right. Exactly. <laughs> And then even having, like, James Earl Jones back to voice Mufasa, it's like you're really just trying to say, oh, yeah, the animated one is is pointless now. And I think that's a horrible thing to do. Now it's CGI animated instead of cell animated. Isn't that great? Cell animated is always better. Yeah. It'll live longer. It'll age better. And I'm not even that big a fan of... The Lion King. It's it's one that it's kind of, I saw it, but I never felt the need to watch it again right or never thought that wow that was you know one of those pivotal moments in disney animation or disney film you know it, it just wasn't it just was one of many right that's yeah. how it always felt for there's me. a lot of people who would disagree with you and i've heard them just get into it about how like oh it's so emotional and the scene where like you know the stampede goes and it was just huge and i'm like yeah it was but like yeah. i don't know it, that movie like never tugged on my heartstrings like it did for so many other people but just the idea that they are completely trying to throw away the animated movie for the cgi movie is ridiculous to me mm-hmm. like i i almost want to hear from like the people who worked on the first movie and just be like do you feel good about this? Yeah, the, you have to think that for some, this does feel a little bit like a slap in the face. Like you're trying to just erase all that work that you did. Right. Uh, like that, it, it does sour a little bit. Um, I, now, I wonder now, you said it, it's a teaser trail, and I wonder if they're kind of throwing in some scenes and maybe doing some stuff to make it look just like the original, but it's not going to be, but they just wanted to sort of just I don't know, pull you in a little bit with it that way. I, I'm not sure I understand the thought process on that. but Right. I don't either. That's what I hope it is. But as of right now, they have sent a clear message, shot for shot remake. Yeah. I'm waiting for a new message. And that, that could be a, a big mistake on their part. But either way, you know, if it is a shot for shot remake, mistake. Yeah. If they're selling it as a shot for shot remake and it's not, mistake. Right. So it's for Disney to make this kind of blunder with a teaser trailer is uh, pretty shocking. Yeah. The other news that's come out, uh, they have kind of released um, what the responses, not the reviews, but the responses for the new Aquaman movies coming out. And anyone who's been listening to the show kind of knows my feelings on like the DC movies. I want to like the DC movies, but they have not been doing well. But for this movie, everyone is saying that it's probably the best DC movie movie at least in terms of like their connected universe to date and that includes wonder woman that's a high bar yeah they're saying it's fun is it's exciting it's a great adaptation of a property and that you know because i really liked wonder woman but the ending kind of fell apart it's just sort of like cgi game battle at the end they're saying this doesn't do that the boss yeah. yeah this is about a, a man becoming a king. This is about a guy embracing his role, and they're saying this is a really good, fun action movie, and that Momoa does more than just carry the character, that he really represents what the character's about. Interesting. So now I really want to go see yeah, it. Yeah, interesting. And this is coming from people who had the same feelings on all the other movies as like I did, so I trust them. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, because I, I, mean, I saw the big uh, trailer when it came out, and I was like, yeah, there's a lot of pretty stuff to look at, but it didn't really give a lot of weight, did not a lot of context to what was really going on. So it's like, it, it actually made it look like a lot 
was going on. It was yeah. like, how are they going to squeeze this into the film? Well, they make it like, what, two and a half hours is one thing. But uh, it just seemed like this could end up being just a big mess of multiple storylines. And that, this sounds, that's interesting that what you're what you're saying, that people are coming away with it saying that. I mean, Wonder Woman, yeah, despite the ending, it's was good phenomenal. Yes. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to give it up for James Wan, because I remember saying that a while ago. If there's anybody involved with this movie that I have faith in, it's James Wan, the director. He's a very good director. He's been around for a bit now, and he knows how to like do a big story. He was one of the people kind of credited for saving the Fast and the Furious franchise. And it's like, that's a franchise that has a lot of characters to <laughs> juggle at once. And uh-huh. he's the one that came along and was like, yeah, I'll give arcs for everybody and do a good job. And yes, he did. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. So yeah, if anyone can pull all these storylines together into something cohesive, then maybe he's the man. Yep. And I'm, I'm happy to hear that the Momoa seems like the man for the part. Cause I'd only really seen him as the, you know, the, the silent heavy. Yeah. Uh, other than showing up in like justice league and whatever. And, even then, he barely really had any. He was there, mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh, having him in the forefront as the star of the film, I was a little apprehensive of that, especially with as Conan didn't uh, pan out too well for him. But um, yeah, we shall see. Interesting. Now, now you got me a little more interested in the film than I I was previously. <laughs> You'll go see it. <laughs> I, I might go see it now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The other bit of news I have is the uh, bunch of Italian researchers at the University of Turin created an algorithm to help categorize the most influential movies of all time. And the top three came out being number one, The Wizard of Oz, number two, the original Star Wars, and number three, Psycho. Interesting. And apparently, like, they've been doing this for a while, and, like, they do it every year. And this is the first year where The Wizard of Oz has topped everybody. Wow. And that was the surprising part to me. It was like, I, I kept thinking, like, it wasn't already? Mm. Well. It's based on, like, uh, like information out online and reviews and just what, like, how people post and things like that. Like, what's actually out there being the influence. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I could see. I'm, I, I'm thinking of it more in the way of how films are done. Where I see Star Wars, I mean, Lucas invented technologies that would then be used and then uh, expounded upon from that point forward to for how movies are made uh, on a technical side. Psycho was just kind of, I can see where it's influential because of, again, how that film, not technology-wise, but how it was directed and that, you know, okay, here's your star and your star's dead in the 30-minute mark. And then, you know, nope, this is your star. Uh, And and just that kind of change of kind of keeping audiences on the edge of their seat sort of thing uh, in a way that hadn't been done before. Wizard of Oz, I think, is... I I don't know. I I, I honestly don't really see how that kind of fits in compared to those other two in my head. It was a a big musical production, but it wasn't the only big musical production. No. Um but the use of Technicolor. Maybe. Maybe that's it. Going from black and white yeah. to some of the most beautiful colors on screen. <laughs> that's true. Back to black and white. <laughs> yeah. But that's true. I don't know. It's interesting. That's an interesting um experiment in the in list yeah. there. Yeah. I think it's kinda cool. Yeah. As far as movies that I think you know, a hundred years from now, from now, people are still going to be talking about. I mm-hmm. think the three you just mentioned are definitely you know still going to top the list. So, unless the world ends, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whichever true. comes first, whichever comes first. All right, so uh, that's all I it. got. All right, that's the news. So we'll take a break. We'll listen for a uh, a promo for season fourteen. Time for a podcast. And when we get back. We're going to look at 1985's The Last Dragon. Fourteen seasons, Sam and Dean Winchester had been busy with saving people, hunting things, and the family business on the CW Supernatural. It sounds like a lot for someone to come along and try to catch up on the hundreds of episodes this show has to offer. But that's exactly what we're making my little sister do, whether she likes it or not. I'm Matt. I'm PG. And I'm Jess. 
two of us are huge fans, one of us is an unspoiled newbie, and we're watching every episode of Supernatural together. We discuss, analyze, and playfully mock this show all to realize that everyone dies and no one gets closure. Listen to Season 14, Time for a Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Google Play. All right, welcome back, folks. Last Dragon, yes, this is the film that we had talked about that I had never seen before. Somehow it escaped my viewing. That's so surprising to me. Uh, And I think maybe this is why, a little bit, no one told me this. I think for some reason it was just the impression I got from hearing people discuss it. I thought this was going to be one of these films that was made in earnest, as like trying someone trying to make a serious martial arts film and it just being so bad it's good. It's not that. <laughs> it's not that. And maybe that's why it just, because that's the kind of stuff, I'll admit it, that that's the stuff that shows up on my radar. Oh, it's bad, but you enjoyed it. Hang on, let me dial that <laughs> up, you know. Um, so this was a very different film. And it, when I, it only took me a few minutes while watching the film to realize... That's not what this movie is, is it? <laughs> no. Especially since the official title is Barry Gordy's yes. The Last Dragon. Barry Gordy, the music producer. Yeah. And so the best way to explain this movie is it is a Motown kung fu romance comedy. Music video. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and I love every second of it. So... I will admit that my, my, my viewing of the film was a little colored by the fact that I was, I was expecting a bad movie that was so bad it was good. And so it took me a while to kind of like, okay, this is just a comedy. These characters are supposed to be over the top like they are, and I need to watch this as a comedy. And it took me a while. I think I would <laughs> – I don't know. I, it was a fun film, and I enjoyed the like over the top. I almost wish it was the other way. I wish this was a bad movie that was good. That was enjoyable. Some people do say that it is. I disagree with them. I think this is a good movie. I think it knew what it was doing. I think all of the decision making was intentional. I think all of the acting choices were intentional. And I think it plays so well. You know, what surprised me, though, after watching this film, it's like, okay, you love this one. I do. But you didn't like the FP. And they are of the same cloth. Because the FP doesn't, the character decisions don't make sense to me. The the hmm. world isn't explored upon enough, and the arc there are almost no arcs. It doesn't the what the characters the characters are the same at the end of the movie as they are at the beginning of the movie. Whereas this that is not true. All right, fair enough. And I, I think you probably appreciate more that this the world that is in the Last Dragon is our world. Yes, it's this these people happen to be living in it. <laughs> right. And whereas the FP, they're like, oh, it's a post-apocalyptic kind of dystopian society. With that, bus service. Yeah. Right. With everything <laughs> being absolutely fine. If it was more of, it's the real world, and then there's this strange thing going on, mm-hmm. that would be a little bit better. All right. All right. Fair enough. Okay. I can see that. Uh, the film stars, how do you say it? Timac? Timac. As Leroy Green, now our he, star. He's the star. Well, this is his starring, this is his first film. Yeah. Um, I, he doesn't go on and do a lot of acting after this, does he? He, he does a little. I know, he does I, a I, bit. Yeah, he does a bit, but I've read he actually goes on. He's He trains a lot of other actors in martial arts for other films. You he's see he's why. a martial arts instructor. He's incredibly, he's very talented. Yes. Especially the, uh, apparently the... Um, Snapping the or catching the arrow out of the air or snapping the arrow out of the air, one of those is an actual. He did that. It took two and a half hours for him to keep trying, but they actually did that to catch it on film. Has to be exhausting. Two and a half hours of <laughs> swiping. Yeah, probably getting hit a bunch. Yeah. Uh, also starring the beautiful Vanity. Name me another movie that stars two people that go by one name. One name. Yeah, I can't do it. <laughs> Have Sharon Madonna ever been in anything? No. <laughs> um. And then a lot of the, these other names are names that I... It's a lot of, of people you've never heard of. Never heard of. They had rec, the faces that I seemed to recognize, but I couldn't tell you from what. Particularly uh, Christopher Murney, who plays like the our, our big bad. Eddie Arcadian. Which is a great He's, villain name. He, yes. Why and is a that? great villain. Yeah. Um, 
he just he looked familiar. I've seen him in something, but I couldn't tell you what. And I haven't had a chance to go through all his filmography. I have a feeling he's going to be one of those character actors that's probably got like a filmography that's as long as your arm. And <laughs> I'll never I'll never figure out what it is. Well, his IMDb picture is just a still shot from this movie. Yeah. Like, so <laughs> when you go to a uh, pretty much everybody in this film usually in their top like three of things you'd recognize them from on imdb is this movie this is this is kind of the peak for a lot of these people uh julius carey as show enough the shogun of harlem the best boss ever <laughs> the best boss villain ever ever oh, ever crazy you can keep your kingpins and your general zods i want Not show, show enough. enough yes there should have been a spinoff you know the 100 percent you know, the origin story of show enough. Well, that's the thing I've heard a lot of people talk about is that that show a lot of people believe that show enough is really a sympathetic character because he grows he grows up on the streets of Harlem with nothing, learns and masters Kung Fu, organizes a gang and, you know, he's doing pretty well for himself. Uh huh. And he gets the hell beat out of him by a guy he just wanted to prove that he was better than. <laughs> uh, he, I think he proves himself to not be a terribly good person, you know, especially when he goes and busts up the Greens pizza place. He's not a good person, but he had to raise himself on the streets of Harlem in probably, you know, the 60s and 70s and into the 80s. Yeah, good point. So you could definitely make him a sim- sympathetic. Would might yes. be, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Not not a uh, anti-hero or anything like that, but right. sympathetic. Yeah, sure, I could see that. Yeah, a few other uh, Faith Prince is uh, the uh, not Cindy Lauper. <laughs> well, as as my wife described, if you ever wanted to see Cindy Lauper, Lucille Ball, and Peggy Bundy all rolled into one, <laughs> yes, yes, that's this character. That's a great description with the voice of Harley Quinn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Apparently, re- reading some trivia, they said they they tried to sort of base her on Cindy Lauper. Sure, was, but uh, yeah, that's a great description. Yeah, and a lot of other... Uh, oh, the uh, most recognizable, I think, is yeah. Mike Starr. No, the mes- most recognizable Who's that? for me was, um, and I can't think of his name, uh, William H. Macy. Oh, that's, yeah, he's one scene. One scene, yeah, but yes, it's like, yes, William yes, I H. Forgot Macy, about that. he's like 20-something, maybe 30. Yeah, this was just like a walk-on for him <laughs> yeah. before anybody It was one of his was. first roles. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That was hysterical. But yeah, Mike Starr plays the broken-down boxer Rock, and he he's one of those character actors who's appeared in a bunch of things. I think yeah. most people will probably recognize him as like the guy who chokes on the rat poison in Dumb and Dumber, the one that gets in the oh, car with them right. and yeah, they yeah, annoy yeah. the hell out of him. That's yeah. who he is. Yeah, he's a great, great character actor. He's kind of fun when you get, when you, when you see him. He, he looks like someone that should be on the Sopranos or something like yeah. that. Yeah. I think he was in, um, yeah, he had a couple of scenes in Goodfellas. There you go. So he yeah. fits that role, that, that tough guy enforcer role. Keisha Knight Pullum makes a brief appearance. You know her from Cosby Show. Yes. Pretty much same time mm-hmm. or maybe just, just before, before Cosby yeah yeah. so yeah she was in there but yeah the rest of the actors are just yeah uh, maybe you see them maybe you not I, 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 like I said I recognized faces but not names it's just I have to had to have seen them as some bit role in some other film or television show at some mm-hmm. point and this movie was written by Louis Venosta who I looked into didn't really do much else no wrote this movie a couple other things and then was gone hmm but then the director, Michael Schultz, has a very long history that continues now in TV writing. And just to name a few, has written for Black Lightning, Arrow, Ally McBeal, Diagnosis Murder, and The Young Indiana Jones Chronicles. Yeah. He's been around for a bit. Yeah. But mostly television. Yeah. This seemed like to be one of his like big uh, his big screen and then um yeah, this went back into did television. Did I say he uh, was a writing history you said director? Writing, direct, di- directing yeah, history. I knew, oh, sorry, I knew what you meant. That's why I didn't correct you. Sorry. For the for those of us that didn't know, yes. <laughs> directing history. Directing. Yeah, so this kind of seemed to be like one of his brief forays in the big film and then yeah. just settled back into television. I mean, I like the direction he took the movie in. I like the angles he set up. I like what he had the characters do. I, I think he did a really good job. My first comment, the first thing, and it's it hits you quick as soon as you start watching the film, is 
the 80s weren't as 80s as this movie was. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to know anything about this movie. Once it's turned on, you know exactly what decade there it came out. There is so many pink popped collars and uh-huh. blue oh, sweaters and, and the hair. And the hair. The music. Yes. Unbelievable. Love it. Yeah. No, like I said, if the 80s were actually this 80s, we'd still be there. It would <laughs> be just that much fun. <laughs> I like this movie because it's a hero's journey kind of movie. Sure. And you've got our star, Leroy Green, who some people give him the nickname of Bruce Leroy, who the movie opens with him, with his 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 teacher, his master saying, I have nothing more to teach you. You you know everything. Go out there and become a master. And so it it's him uh, trying to find somebody else to kind of teach him to take him to the next level, mm-hmm. to to get the inner the outer glow, yes. the glow of power. That when you hit that final level, you'll have the glow of power that can let you do anything. Yes, so apparently, if you can achieve this glow, they, uh, that person can change the world. Yes. So that's that's his goal. So yes, the master tells him to to go off find a new master. Not even to become a master. That's that's what he's telling him sort of secretly. But he tells him he has to go off in search of a new master without actually... He has to go on this journey on his own and discover what it is that he's to become on his own. We find that out all, you know, throughout the film. And maybe if you, you know, you're wise enough, you can figure it out from the beginning. But so, yes. So Leroy is going off in search of the, someone else to continue his, his training without realizing that you know, it all has to come from himself, from well, who, inside. Who is he sent to find? Uh, you'd have to... Some dumb goy. <laughs> <laughs> who he finds and finds out it's just a computer that writes... Prints out fortune cookies. Yeah, prints out the fortune cookie fortunes and realizing that he is to be, he is supposed to become his own master. But along the way, he uh, ends up saving this pop singer... That goes by the name of um, Laura Charles. Yeah, she's like a um, sort of like a uh, a video show host too, as well as being a performer. She hosts her own uh, show, like an MTV style yeah. uh, program, uh, Seventh Heaven. I yeah. think it's called. She's super popular. One of those like you know everybody wants to like either be her or be with her. He saves her when she gets jumped by the goons of Eddie Arcadian, who has this idea of well if my girlfriend who i've turned into a singer can have her video be on this show she'll be a star and i'll get rich right and it's a very down-to-earth plan it's not take over the city take over the world it's i you know it's a get rich quick scheme that he's trying to make happen with like hired thugs right yeah, because Laura Charles won't play the video. Right, and that's what I love about her character. She stands her ground. Like, yeah. she does have to be rescued. She is a little bit of a damsel in distress. But she's there because she's like, no, her singing's awful, this video's garbage, and you're a sleaze. And I, no, <laughs> no, no. And I love that about her character. Yeah. She still, you know, she stands up for herself. Yeah, I love it. They they kidnap her and they force her to watch the video. And she won't look. <laughs> yeah, and they have to force her to watch. They're like, okay, so you're going to ship, you're going to play it, right? Like, no. no. <laughs> it's awful. <laughs> yeah, the video is absolutely terrible. Uh, yeah. And you have to watch a lot of the video. They yeah. don't show you eight seconds. They show you like a minute and a half of this thing. Yeah, yeah. You get pretty much the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, a couple, you get a couple, uh, bits of this uh, this woman's performance unfortunately <laughs> but unless you're a fan of like Cindy Lauper then yeah it's not that bad <laughs> <laughs> kind of liked her so <laughs> so yeah he saves her a couple times they kind of start to fall for each other a little bit but he's focused on trying to find his new master that he can't really commit to a relationship but he kind of wants to he's feeling yeah torn right we should mention that he is completely immersed in the asian martial arts world yeah uh he wears the the he looks like he's stepped out of a bruce lee movie he wears the the the, the asian style uh, i forget the, the gi the gi thank you he sits there in the movie watching a bruce lee film eating popcorn with chopsticks i love that <laughs> <laughs> so yes he's completely like almost like a a monk, you know, just completely devoted yes. to the martial arts. So, yeah, the idea of a of, of a woman of of a relationship 
completely not even hasn't even crossed his mind until till her until he sees her and then suddenly oh girls aren't bad <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> and it should be mentioned that he's probably about like 20 years old because i think mm-hmm. that's about how old time Mac was at the time of this film in like 2021 right and if this movie wasn't fun enough the scene with his family is so great where we see his parents mm-hmm. and they have their own pizza place and I love his, you know, he's got his younger brother and his like baby sister and they're, you know, his younger brother who's really into Laurel Charles and his younger brother's making fun of him. And then finally the dad's like, oh, you think he's, you think he's weird? You think everything he does is silly? Look at me. I'm a black man who opened a pizza place. Everybody thought I was weird. <laughs> <laughs> pizza place in Harlem. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I like the look of that pizza place. I wanted to go and get a slice. Yeah, no, they, they, they filmed a lot of this stuff on location in New York, including, I mean, that was a pizza restaurant in, uh, like, lower Manhattan, it says. It looked like one. Uh, they also visited, there was an Oriental Delicatessen, what they used completely with however it was decorated when they walked in. That's the way it, they, it showed up on film. Um, just a, a Chinese warehouse, um, a couple abandoned factories, but all of it done right there in New York, right in Manhattan. So that's kind of cool. So you really do get a slice of uh, of New York in 1985. That might be the other reason I like it, because I absolutely love New York City, having grown up right outside it. And New York City, both in the 80s and now, has a look and a texture to it that really is impossible to duplicate. Like I've seen other movies where like they say, Oh yeah, it's New York. I'm like, that's not New York. Yeah, and then you find out, Oh, we filmed in Minnesota. Toronto. Yeah. <laughs> and it's awful. And yeah, especially New York in the eighties, like you can't duplicate that grime and that just all of it. And mm-hmm. yeah, there it is. That makes total sense that they would film on location. Yeah. It, it's not in this little blurb of trivia I'm reading now, but somewhere else I read that the movie theater that they filmed, you know, show nuffs when he first shows up and they're watching the Bruce Lee. That was like an adult, uh, adult movie theater. That the they one used. that's empty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's the other part I want to talk about is the movie theater where show enough shows up for the first time. And he is so intimidating. He's enormous. Mm-hmm. He's so tall. He always has some kind of like, big shoulder pads on. Well, he's got like, it's, it's, it's almost a Shogun themed. Yeah. Um, it's not exactly, but it's that Shogun themed shoulder armor yeah. or something. Every yes. time he shows up and he wants to challenge Leroy to a fight because he's saying that he is the baddest guy in Harlem and no one is better at Kung Fu than him. And then somebody goes, Bruce Leroy's better because mm-hmm. Leroy's got a reputation. And, Shonuff has heard of him and he goes, this is a guy that it's just stories. There's no way you're that good. There's no way you're actually better than me. People say you can catch bullets with your teeth. Get up right now. We're going to fight. We're going to prove who's actually better. Leroy doesn't want to fight him. Yeah, that's what I really loved about Leroy is that he truly takes on the whole the the kung fu mentality. Like, no, this is just it's for self-defense. It's not. You don't strike out in anger. Right. You know, this isn't, that's not the way of the, that this life goes. Right. So he's like, I don't have to prove anything to you is pretty much his attitude. Like, I don't need, I don't need, I don't want to fight you. And he does because I, he doesn't care. Let mm-hmm. show enough think he's better. It does, what, what does it, what harm does it do him? <laughs> He comes to find out it does a lot of harm. <laughs> yeah, as it turns out. So he just, you know, a fight does erupt in the theater, but Leroy doesn't partake in it. He nope. just walks out. But later, uh, Shonuff kind of tracks down where Leroy lives and where his parents work, and they destroy the pizza place. Mm -hmm. I mean, they annihilate it. They do everything but burn it down. Yeah. And this causes a lot of inner turmoil for Leroy. And that was the other scene that I loved where he's back at – because he has his own dojo where he's teaching kids. He's doing all right for himself. Mm -hmm. And he's – taking out all of his anger and frustration on the uh the i guess the kickboxing bag and he's drenched in sweat he looks like he's been there for hours and that's a part of this movie that a lot of other like kung fu movies don't really do they don't show you that inner turmoil come out in a hero if a hero is going to be that whole like peaceful i don't have to fight you they're going to stick with that all the way up until they're forced to fight Mm -hmm. this takes the moment to show you this is not an easy decision for him he kind of thinks should i go fight him i kind of want to go fight him because this shouldn't happen to my family right but he knows he shouldn't right yeah revenge is not it's 
is not is not right. But he wants it. Yeah. And I, I absolutely love that side of this movie and this character. It's so surprising both the, 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 the turmoil with him suddenly having an attraction for, for this woman, then the inner turmoil of wanting revenge, but knowing that goes against the, you know, the teachings that he's followed all his life. It's a pretty highbrow concept for a film that is effectively an over-the-top comedy. Yeah. It's surprising. It's almost to the point of, of you thinking that, you know, what is the tone of this film? Like, it doesn't really have a tone. It's, again, just kind of all over the place. It's all over the place, but at no point in time did I ever feel like it was a mess. I felt Mm -hmm. like, okay, we're going to take a moment to have this tone, and then we're going to take a moment to have that tone. And they, for me, they flow, because he tries to, like, then meditate on his feelings, and that's when Laura shows up, and she had tracked him down, and she's like, you've saved me. I like you. I think you like me. I need a bodyguard. You want to be my bodyguard? Mm-hmm. And I, now it kind of moves into that side of it. And he goes off. And there is another part, actually, I, I forgot about. When he's teaching his kids in the dojo. I was hoping you were going to talk about his kids. There's one kid in particular I really loved. There's two kids that I absolutely loved. One is the kid that actually doesn't... <laughs> It appears to have not been paying attention and doesn't know a thing about martial arts, but he's Asian. So his his sort of tactic is just to be the Asian kid who does the, the, the kung fu screaming and throwing out a couple poses or something every now and again and figuring that's going to scare people enough that they won't bother him. I love that. Johnny Yu. That was a fantastic joke. I mean, that just... I'm like, oh my God, that joke would work today. Yes. That's a great, I loved it. Johnny Yu is the character that I really wish had a spinoff. I, I would watch a movie. That, he, that guy was good. The character was hilarious. That's a movie I would watch for like an hour and a half. <laughs> no problem. Just him going around doing that and getting his butt kicked. <laughs> he he was the type of character that you would, you're just so used to seeing in like 80s films. You, he could have been in meatballs he could have been in you know (laughs) that's just he's that young guy uh just and that same thing is like oh i don't actually know martial arts i just scream and you know throw my hands up and people don't mess with me like that would work in any context (laughs) loved it the other kid in his dojo that i liked was the kid by the name of ty the really young kid Mm -hmm. who people might recognize like he had some serious real moves. He could fight, he could flip, he could kick all of it. He also was in the red Sonia movie Mm -hmm. as like the, that young like emperor kid who had like that big lumbering servant that worked with him. He goes on to play Kino in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles two. And yet he's kind of made a little bit of a career for himself as like a martial artist on screen. And Mm -hmm. As a child, he knew how to fight, and he's great in this movie. He was in the uh, the short-lived series with Gil Gerard from uh, Buck Rogers called uh, Sidekicks. Oh, nice. Yeah, he had his own series there for a short time. Uh, Again, as pretty much the same sort of kid, you know, the kid that knew the martial arts who gets somehow, I don't remember the circumstances, saddled with like a a cop who was played by Gil Gerard, and they go out and solve crimes. (laughs) And he kicks everyone's butt. (laughs) Exactly. But did you notice what Leroy was wearing when he was giving his lessons? Yeah, the Bruce Lee, the yellow. The yellow, the yellow with the and black, black stripe. Uh-huh. Yep, from the game of death. Yeah. Because that's the other part is he's obsessed with Bruce Lee. Sure. He's a super fan. And I just like that little, like, either you notice it or you don't. And it's just that little thing that gets picked up. Mm-hmm. Well, and he, he is a super fan, but what's kind of fun, he kind of represents a lot of super fans of the era, the eighties when the Bruce Lee films were first kind of started the seventies and eighties when the Bruce Lee films started, started coming into the United States, there was a lot of American kids that were totally obsessed with Bruce Lee that wanted to learn martial arts to be like Bruce Lee. So he did represent that little group of, 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 of people. And yeah, he was able to, t- because this isn't a, this is a film. He was able to take it to that next level <laughs> and actually being skilled at what he was doing. Leroy comes up with the idea of, you know, trying to track down 
some dumb goy, but finds out it's a computer, <laughs> goes back, talks to his master, and his master is so funny. He's mm-hmm. just sort of like, oh, it was just a computer. And, and, and he's, Leroy is like, but this medallion, you gave me this medallion. this medallion. You said it was Bruce Lee's, he's and like, it would lead me. as like, oh, most people would use it to hold up their pants. Right. It's just... <laughs> It's this whole, like, you know, it's been inside you the whole time, Dumbo. Like, you can yeah. do it on your own. And I think that's, like, a really good kind of message. And I was looking into it, and I was like, oh, it's kind of like the same idea of, like, in Spaceballs. Like, I got the ring out of a Cracker Jack box. Right. But this is before Spaceballs, mm-hmm. which I think is wonderful that there's so much kind of originality to this movie. Laura Charles does get kidnapped one more time. Mm-hmm. And at this point... Um, well, Arcadian has hired like every thug in New York, including Show Nuff, including Show to Nuff. try to take out uh, Leroy Green. Because when uh, Leroy saved her the first time or the second time after she got kidnapped by Arcadian, Leroy broke in, knocked everyone out, almost got Eddie killed by shoving him into some tank that has piranhas. S- yeah. They don't really the, show what it is, but the, it's terrifying. It was like the, the cartoon piranhas that, you know, you drop it in and the water goes crazy and then, you know, a bone comes out. You know, <laughs> it, yeah. So he's just angry that someone touched him, someone hit him, someone hurt him. Mm-hmm. Because at this point, his girlfriend has left him. Yeah, she doesn't want any of this. I don't right. want you to kill anybody. I'm out. I love her arc. It's really yeah. short, but it's great. Her character goes from, I want to be a star to... Well, not at that price. Mm -hmm. And she leaves him, and it's great. So now he just wants revenge. He just wants Leroy dead. Right. Kidnaps Laura Charles, knowing that Leroy will show up. Leroy decides to go face him alone. All of these ridiculous character villains are there, which I wish they had spent a little bit more time diving into. Like, you were almost at the point of, like, I'm the waffler. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, you don't really get the chance to you don't get the uh as much of a um audition as you might want for uh, some of these guys. I would have ten minutes of auditions, I would have Because yeah, it turns it. into some almost you feel like it becomes like game of death or something like that, where he should have to face off each of them in turn yes. or something. And that doesn't really happen, but you kind of want melee. it to happen. Yeah. yeah. So it's this big melee, he deals with like half of them, but then he's getting overwhelmed mm-hmm. and he's about to lose. And then his students show up. And I love that fact that his students come to his rescue. All of these kids that he's been training and teaching are the ones that save him. And it's like his life choices have led to this moment. So they all fight off the bad guys. He runs off to get Laura, who Arcadian is dragging into like the next warehouse and who's waiting for him? They're show enough. They're show enough. And they have a huge, it's a good fight. Yeah. And his brother, Leroy's brother is there. And because he's trying to save Laura too, since he has this massive crush on her, but he's useless because yes. he's like, <laughs> he's like 13 years old and can't do anything. He doesn't know how to fight. They did a nice job. I briefly thought that, you know, he, uh, Leroy gets the upper hand. Take Shonuff out. Shonuff is boom. Looks like he's out and he's on the done. ground. He's done. I'm thinking, well, that was rather disappointing. And like, I, I, I honestly thought that that's where they were going to end it. And I thought, wow, that's a that's a damn shame. But Leroy's exhausted. He's yeah. been fighting people all night. He's got to go up against this enormous man beast. Yeah. <laughs> Takes him out, and he just sort of like slumps down. Like, okay, that's over. Let me go save Laura. And then you hear Shonuff just go, Leroy. Yeah, and he turns and, Le- and he's there. They're, yeah, Shonuff is nowhere to be found. I'm like, oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when my favorite song in the movie starts. You hear him go, Leroy, and then you hear the bell ring, and then the song starts. And I, I have sung this song to myself <laughs> many times over the years. I really should go see if I can like download it somewhere. The soundtrack was released. I don't know how much of some of this music is on. Some some made the soundtrack, some did not, from what I've, I've read. But there is a soundtrack out there for you. I got to go find that song. And Shonuf uh, reveals himself. He has the glow. Well, kind of. He has it in his hands. He has it in his feet. He doesn't have a whole body glow. Because there is a part earlier in the movie where Leroy's talking about, you know, true masters can have a whole body glow. But even if you have it just in your hands, there's so much power there. Mm -hmm. And so Shonuf shows that he has it in his hands. Which is a bit of a kind of deflating moment for Leroy. He sees that. And yeah, you could see it in his face that... I'm about to die. Yeah. So 
Leroy gets his ass royally kicked every which way. He's he's just bloody and bruised. And but what Shonoff wants is not just to defeat him. He wants Leroy to admit who the master is. Mm-hmm. And he's dunking his head into a tank of water over and over again, demanding that Leroy admit that Shonoff is the master. And as he's being dunked into the water, all of his lessons and his feelings for Laura come to the surface. Mm-hmm. More like his life flashing before his eyes. Yeah. And it finally makes sense. <laughs> it makes sense that he's his own master and everything mm-hmm. that he knows is already in him. And he's pulled out of the water one more time and show enough asks, who's the master? Yeah. I am. I am. <laughs> and his whole body glows. And the other part that I like is when he's pulled out, I don't know if you noticed, he's healed. Mm-hmm. Yep, I did. All of his, the blood is gone. His bruises are gone. There's a there's a flaw. Though. There's one flaw where the camera angle turns and you see the holdover makeup. Yeah. But then it switches back and you yeah. don't see that mistake yep, again. Exactly. And yeah, all of his markings are gone and he's fine. Mm-hmm. Shonuff tries to punch him and Leroy catches the punch. You hear the crunch. Yeah, he's like breaking <laughs> down on his hands and then he just destroys Shonuff, flying kicks him into the water. And what I like is he pulls him out of the water. He doesn't let him die. No, exactly. He doesn't kill him. He just slumps him over the side and Shonuff is defeated but not killed. And I have to say that, you know, 1985, we're still in the, you know, we're not in the computer animation yet. So it is just animated. You actually see the glow. It, it's, it's kind of Adobe After Effects level, yeah. you know, whatever. But it's actually done really, especially the actual hits. Yeah. The, the one that we're actually the doing the, the hitting and the sparking and everything. Actually pretty impressive. And it really works into that 80s look. Sure. And that mentality. Like, I wouldn't want it updated. I wouldn't want somebody to come along and make it look better. Like, you wouldn't. No. You would ruin it. I think it. it looked fine as is. I don't think you could make it look better. I think it looked exactly the way it needed to look. And it, it, I thought it actually came looked really great. And it, was, I, it was well-timed. Yes. It was, you know, it fit to the shapes because you it, the glow and you see the kind of the glow and the blare over the body. So it follows the contours of whatever they're, they're hitting. And it's like, it was really well done. Yes. Eddie shows up and he's like, you know what? I'm just going to put an end to that. Yeah, what you just did was great, but a 45 will put an end to all this kung fu crap. I'd like that. That there was almost that's a, that alone is almost a gag too, because someone pulls out a gun and Eddie's <laughs> like, no, 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 no. I want this. You know, I want this to go down this other way. You know, he, he actually, wants him humiliated, right? Yeah. So he take, keeps the gun. He's like, yes, you could just take it out. Just. You could have just shot him right then, but right. no, 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 I no, don't use the gun. It's like, mm. that, that in its own way is a little bit all throws into that sort of uh, the little play, almost like scary movie, you know, oh, don't, you know, I'll be right back, you know, that <laughs> kind of thing, you know. Yeah. They're kind of highlighting the, the ridiculousness of having everyone go at him with martial arts. When you have a gun, you could just shoot. <laughs> mm-hmm. But it makes sense that Eddie wants him humiliated. He's like, this guy punched me. I want everybody to punch him. I want right. him broken and bloodied. I want to stand over him before he's finished off. I don't want just a quick bullet to the face. But now that's not an option. So now he's like, all right, I'll just shoot him. And mm-hmm. that's it. Pulls the trigger. Leroy flips back. He's down. He's out. Laura's in the corner. She's crying. His brother runs up to Laura. He's like, wait, what happened? And then Eddie goes over, flips over the body. And then Leroy reveals that he caught the The bullet bullet with his his teeth. teeth. (laughs) I love that part. There's no part of me that doesn't think that's great. (laughs) Absolutely impossible. And who cares? Who cares? In this world, yeah, if you got the glow, you can catch a bullet with your teeth. Forget arrows. <laughs> <laughs> Catches the bullet with his teeth, knocks uh, Eddie Arcadian down, punches him in the face, and then hoists him up on a chain. And then Arcadian is like, oh my God, that was amazing. Can you, what, can, you, you gotta go on tour. I'll be your manager. <laughs> just give me a finder's fee. I'll do it for free. That was amazing. Like, he does not care that he just lost. He just wants to be a part of this miracle that he saw. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so Leroy runs off because the police show up because all of, I guess, his students took care of everybody in the right. other room and they call the police. And for really no good reason, the police arrest Eddie Arcadian, but I guess we have witnesses to what he did. Right. And then so Laura has to go back and produce her show because they have a live show later that night. 
but Leroy's nowhere to be found. So all of the students and all of like the singers and whatnot are dancing around the studio and they're all having a good time and she's bored. She's up there because where, where did Leroy go? And he had to go change. (laughs) He had to go put on his white outfit and get some flowers and he shows back up and we have our happy ending. Yep. That's the, and that's the last dragon. I love that movie. (laughs) It is a fun film. And in like we were describing some of the themes that play into the film are much bigger themes than you would expect out of a film, not only of this genre, but of this time. Yeah. 1985. You didn't get this kind of character arc. You didn't get this kind of, you know, the inner turmoil. You got the let's peek on the girls in their in the uh, in the locker room, and then uh, oh, you're all right, and let's let's date. That's right. pretty much the plot of almost any film out of the mid '80s, and that wasn't in this one. You know, he has to sort of. Yes, she's she's immediately sort of attracted to him and everything, but in the end, you know, she has to kind of earn she has to earn his, uh, I, I think, uh, affection a mm-hmm. little bit, or at least make him realize that it's okay to be attracted to somebody. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's just a lot different than I was expecting for the for the time and for the type of film that it was. But yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was a fun film. Would you watch it again? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Especially now. I mean, like I said, it took me a long time to get get out of my head that this wasn't made to be a bad movie, or wasn't someone wasn't trying to make a movie that turned out really bad. So I I would very much want to sit down and watch it, going, okay, this is a comedy. Mm -hmm. Let's sit down and just have fun. Um, So yeah, absolutely, I'd watch it again. It's a great movie to kind of like make other people watch because it is one of those movies that like a lot of people haven't seen, but those who have swear by it. 100%. 100%. We watched it. Uh, my wife had never seen it. So she loved it. Like, she was dancing along to the songs. <laughs> she was like, this is good. Oh, yeah. You like the 80s. Oh, yeah. If you if you grew up watching MTV and VH1, yeah, this is a film for you for sure. And so we, we watched it on Thanksgiving. That, and then we decided, you know what? We're going to have a tradition. We're going to watch this every, every Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving from now on. So that is our plan. And then she even said to me, well, I think I'm going to watch it again before next Thanksgiving. Yeah. <laughs> she was so into it. You know, what's funny. The, the title, The Last Dragon. Doesn't, doesn't make sense. Doesn't play into the film at no. all. I think that's like the one thing you could fix. Like that. That's the like the 80s studio part. We need a cool, cool kung fu title. And it, yeah. it gets mentioned at the beginning where he's training with his master and his master is like, that's it. You're done. You don't, you're not with me anymore. And he like pulls off like the little like pendant that oh, he has like right. the that badge the on his dragon. yeah yeah he's like you are the last like does that mean he had other students or were those other ones like his other levels of training i, I, I assumed that was like different levels it's kind of like you get different badges or yeah. something yeah yeah and so he's saying this is it this was the last one you're on your own and so i guess that's what it is it's him he had the last dragon okay okay i forgot about that bit but you made right. a good song yeah <laughs> <laughs> made a real good song yeah, the soundtrack would be fun to listen to on its own. Yeah, well, I appreciate you bringing this film up, and um, or a lot of people. It's it's kind of weird. This film just kind of came up in topic on a couple different occasions. It seemed like it was destined to be watched and discussed here because people keep kept bringing it up all about the same time. I'm like, okay, all right, I'll watch the film. And it was good because when it got brought up on our time shifters group everyone was like oh yeah no 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 watch that one that's a good one (laughs) (laughs) that's what i mean if you've seen it you want others to see it yeah yeah and that's kind of how i feel too this is also a kind of film where i feel like i lost a little something by not watching it with somebody sure yeah i almost wish i had sat down with someone that had already seen it or a group of people uh, whether we'd seen it or not and all sat down and watched it. I feel like this is a, uh, this is definitely a party movie. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of thing. You definitely need to be just with friends and, and watch this one. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess that will do it for this show. Uh, thanks very much everyone for tuning in. Uh, if you've seen the last dragon, you know, come onto the Facebook group and continue the comment thread there, or send us an email at timeshifterspodcast at gmail.com or tweet at us at Time Shifters Pod or at Movies at the Met. That's going to do it. We don't have anything lined up for next episode yet. Um, but I think if I got my sums right, this will be the last episode that comes out before the Christmas holiday. 
So I, of course, want to wish everyone happy holidays. Have a fun and safe Christmas. Um, I think Hanukkah will have happened in between recordings. <laughs> so I hope you had a wonderful Hanukkah and whatever holiday you celebrate, just uh, be a be a joyous one and have fun and you know stay safe. If you uh, don't get around to listening to this until after New Year's, hope, you know, hope you're still around. Happy Festivus, everybody! Yeah, there you go, Festivus. That's perfect. And maybe uh, what I will do is my favorite holiday song. I'll I'll play out uh, play out on this on this episode which was from the Mystery Science Theater 3000 uh, episode. I don't remember which episode it came from, but they're, they did the uh, Merry Christmas, If if That's Okay. <laughs> it's probably my, my favorite holiday song. So I think that's what I'll use to play us out. So enjoy that, and uh, we'll talk to you next time. Bye, everybody. Hi, folks. Welcome back to the satellite. As a special treat, Crow, Tom, and I have written and are going to perform an original Christmas carol. Uh, uh, Mike, it's not just for Christmas, it's for holidays of all faiths. Yeah, right. and don't uh, call it a carol, because no. carol is a woman's name, and we want this song to be all-inclusive. Right, why don't you hit a camera? There we go. Let us all now sing our praises to the Lord today. Although you may not share our belief system, which is perfectly okay. Maybe you worship an abstract being that is kind of vague. Or maybe you just worship a guy whose name is Greg. Perhaps your religion doesn't include a time called Lent. But whatever your religion is, we support you 100%. So sit around the fire and have a chestnut roast. roast. Or raise a glass in toast toast. to happy days, Donnie Moe. But if you prefer to eat Indian food on Christmas Day, I can only shrug my shoulders and say namaste. Namaste. Personally, I prefer prefer turkey gravy and salad, but let's never forget, forget. all cultures are valid, so let's have peace on earth and cut out all the bull, let's have a holiday season that's multicultural, if there's one point we'd like to make with this festive holiday song, it's that Christmas comes just once a year, so for a few days for crying out loud, can we all just get along? Hey, wow. That was actually pretty good. It was great. It was lovely. Good job. Very nice. Good job. Thank you.